This morning we are pleased to have join us for a discussion on what is happening in Syria with Mr. Farid Ghadri. In October of 2001, Mr. Ghadri, along with several Syrian Americans, formed the Reform Party of Syria. A constitution was written and a constructive and comprehensive program has, was put in place to bring regime change to Syria. Today, the party is enjoying the tacit support from many organizations and people in the U.S. administration and think tanks in Washington. Mr. Ghadri and the other co-founders of the Reform Party of Syria are hoping to return to Syria to rebuild the country on the basis of principles of real economic and political reforms that will usher democracy, prosperity, freedom of expression, and human rights, in addition to lasting peace with open borders with all of Syria's neighboring countries. At this moment, I am pleased to welcome to the call Mr. Farid Ghadri, co-founder of the Reform Party of Syria. Uh, thank you, Jim, for this uh, introduction. I hope everyone is hearing me well. Um, I'd like to talk today about, uh, and thank you for Jinsa for hosting this. I'd like to talk today about two important issues related to, to what's happening inside Syria. I think we all read uh, the newspapers and what's going on in, in terms of uh, the, what the West is doing and what the U.S. and Europe and so forth. But uh, what, what's going on on the ground uh, in terms of the armed struggle and in terms of uh, the religious tensions that, that is happening is, I think, is of importance to all of us. Um, I'd like to start with the Free Syrian Army. As we all know, this is the main body today that has been or is still uh, fighting uh, the Assad regime, and they're fighting as a result of, of their attempt to defend themselves. Uh, this revolution started by civilians uh, seeking democracy, economic parity, and justice, and uh, unfortunately, after a while, it, it's ending up into a violent struggle on both sides. Um, the free, I'm in touch directly with the leadership of the Free Syrian Army. And, and I, there are certain aspects of the Free Syrian Army that we need to be aware of. Uh, number one, uh, you don't reach the uh, title or at least the rank of a colonel in, uh, in the Assad Army if you were involved or had any affiliation with any extremist religious group. So in a sense, uh, when we talk to the Free Syrian Army, those colonels and captains and so forth, uh, we know that they are being vetted by, by Assad himself, and we know that these people are trustworthy, and they're not, uh, they don't have any religious inclinations either way. Uh, they're neutral in their position, and they are really uh, just uh, uh, you know, ranking armed forces uh, army people and so forth, uh, trying to do uh, good for their country. Uh, that's one aspect that's very important. And so from the perspective, from our perspective, from Syrian perspective, but also from the Western perspective, uh, these are people we can, we can work with uh, uh, in a variety of ways. Uh, we also talk to, uh, I've had the chance to talk to commanders. Uh, we put some commanders on, uh, on the ground, uh, on Skype, uh, and we were able, what, I, what we're trying to do is, is uh, try to determine the popularity of the Free Syrian Army inside, the, inside the Syria, mm -hmm. because as you know, the leadership is in Turkey. And uh, we, we had confirmation, many of those organizations and many of those leaders, uh, uh, the commanders on the ground, the commanders of battalions and so forth, uh, confirming to us that uh, they consider the Free Syrian Army as uh, the main body that they follow and they, they take orders from. Uh, and so it, 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 we have confirmation that the Free Syrian Army is the body that we need to deal with in the future. They have the popularity and they have the fighters inside the street. Um, in terms of who is fighting today, we have a lot of defections taking place and they're still taking place. Uh, in certain areas, they're, they're, uh, they're uh, uh, more than a trickle, and, but in other areas, they're just trickles here and there. In Aleppo, for example, we don't have as many defections as we have in central Syria. Or, uh, or eastern Syria, or the south part of Syria. Um, but these people, the, the, the defectors, have been taking arms, uh, taking their arms and using it to defend the people, defend the, uh, uh, the population. Most of, you know, they have the training to do that, but also the civilians have the two-year training, mandatory uh, military training in the Syrian army, and so they're able to join uh, with the defectors to, 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 uh, to defend themselves or to attack sometimes uh, uh, con uh, convoys or supply lines of uh, the, uh, the, uh, the armed forces of Assad. Some of those civilians uh, started as, you know, 
local coordination committee leaders, uh, um, uh, co- you know, people who coordinate between uh, the injured and the hospitals and, and the political aspects uh, with the Syrian opposition. But many of them have joined the armed struggle. We have seen a shift in the last uh, three, four months where uh, a young person of 25, 28, 30, who was uh, early on just uh, kind of a, a, a civilian um, discussing issues related to what's going on in the street now, and now becoming an actual fighter. And so that shift is important because that shows that not only the factions uh, are fighting the Assad regime, but they're also a civilian population, well-trained, and, and, and are able to, uh, to fight the regime. The arms smuggling into Syria is, is going on in, in a big way. It's still in the small arms uh, range, the Kalashnikov, you know, the, 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 the rocket launchers and so forth. Uh, but it's coming in from different parts. We know that it's coming in from Iraq. Uh, I personally know of, uh, of, of someone who's smuggling these arms, who's helping smuggling these arms. And, uh, and, the, uh, and we, we, they tell us and they, they kind of keep us informed, keep me personally informed what's going on. Um, and and it's, it's, uh, it, the flow will continue. I don't think there's a way that the regime can stop it or that there's a way that, uh, that uh, uh, these people will stop uh, getting arms inside Syria. So I think that, that process is going to be ongoing, which will uh, elongate the time the struggle is, is going to go on. From the perspective of the other issue that's very important to, to all of us, I think, is the religious aspect of this struggle. Early on, we've seen a lot of people just uh, take the side of a revolution. You know, there are Syrians fighting for a revolution. But uh, over the last three, four months, I would say, we have started seeing a lot of comments on Facebook. A lot of people talk about this is really a religious uh, uh, war. This is uh, the Alawis against the Sunnis, the Sunnis against the Alawis. And it it's highlights the danger, the underlying danger of, of, of uh, this, uh, this struggle inside Syria. And that's a very dangerous thing for, for Syrians, uh, as you can imagine. But it's unstoppable. Um, I know people that have never talked in that language uh, but inside Syria. And now they're, uh, it's becoming a, a common thing for them. And that's a very dangerous thing as far as I'm concerned because it's driving the whole struggle inside Syria into an event that could be religious in its aspect, that could end up ugly, that could have repercussions for the whole region. Um, But at the same time, the longer we keep the struggle going, uh, the longer this will go on. And I think had we uh, nipped this at the bud early on, maybe we wouldn't have been in this position. But that's the reality of what's going on inside Syria. Now, inside Syria, as you know, there are a lot of minorities, about 30%. There's another uh, 14, 15% of Kurds. So almost half the population is minority-based, which makes Syria a very interesting um, stew, as we can say, if I can say that. Uh, You have the extremist Salafis on one side. Uh, that are being coming in, inside Syria, you know, trickling inside to, to Syria. But you also have the Yazidis, who are just, you know, total atheists. Uh, that combination uh, uh, provides for uh, an interesting uh, 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 social structure inside Syria. However, the gravitas inside Syria today is between the minorities and the Muslim Sunni majority. But the Muslim Sunni majority is what's extremely interesting to know, uh, to find out about. Uh, and I'm one of those uh, uh, people. I'm a Sunni Muslim by, uh, by birth. Most of the Muslims today in Syria, because of what's going on, are sitting on the fence. They're devout Muslims. There's no doubt about it. Uh, most of them follow very strict conservative uh, views. Uh, their homes are, are bastion of uh, religious beliefs. And, uh, and uh, devout, they are devout Muslims. Uh, some practice Sharia inside their homes, some don't. Uh, but it has always been restricted to the home. Today with the struggle, we're seeing about 30, 40%, 30%, I would say, of the population, total population, uh, sitting on a fence in the sense that they, we can tip them over to becoming extremists or we can tip them over to the other side 
where they can remain devout Muslims, but not in, embrace extremist views and extremist ideas. And that's where we kind of lose control of what's happening in Syria, because as you know, the Muslim Brotherhood is, is engaged heavily. Uh, they've been supported, unfortunately, by Prime Minister of uh, Turkey, Erdogan, and, uh, and we, are, we are continuously trying to keep that balance, or at least keep these people uh, on the fence. And on the fence by, by saying to them, look, Sharia is, is okay at home, but just don't take it to school, to, the, to, uh, to a, a stadium, and so forth and so on. Well, what, what, what needs to be done in this aspect to keep them there is really to transfer the power of the devout Muslims, the sheikh that are in, in Syria today, to a, a position where they can influence those people in a positive way. And one of the, one of the ways we can do that is, is embrace, encourage those sheikh who have uh, the ear, their ear to the ground, they have the popularity inside the street, but at the same time, they're trying to either keep them on the fence or flip them to, the, to our side, flip them to the side where they don't, they, they don't become extremists. And, and these people exist, as a matter of fact, and they're issuing a lot of fatwas these days. And, um, and their fatwas are being, even though they're on a smaller scale in terms of rank, their fatwas are being spread very wide inside Syria. And the reason why is because the, the highest rank sheikhs are afraid, they don't talk, uh, they don't say anything. And so there's, a, there's a, a, a subtle transfer of power from the high rank sheikh inside Syria to the middle rank sheikh inside Syria. And the reason why is that that majority middle, middle rank is really not silent. They're, st- they're taking a stand. They're standing, uh, standing by the people, and they're issuing fatwas that are helping the people, while the other ones are, are the, you know, the high-ranked ones are being silent. As a matter of fact, we, I know of a fatwa that's coming up uh, very soon, where the middle uh, uh, sheikhs are attacking, are going to start attacking the, the top ranks for being silent uh, on, on this issue. And so those people are, uh, and, the, and some of these people I know personally are in touch with the West, uh, as, as a matter of fact, they've extended a hand to Israel. Uh, they've, they've, they've tried to kind of uh, uh, build a consensus amongst them. And I feel that these, this leadership, that new middle rank leadership, is something that we need to uh, engage with. It's an asset that needs to be uh, cultivated, and, uh, and we need to do more than just uh, you know, know about them. I think, for example, a TV station, uh, something where their voices can come out in the open, and they're able to engage with the Syrian people and kind of keep them from flipping to the extremist Muslim Brotherhood side is going to be an important uh, uh, component in our, in our struggle. Um, that's, you know, that's the overall uh, picture of what's going on inside Syria, uh, the religious aspect uh, and, the, and the free Syrian army uh, aspect. Uh, you all know what's going on in terms of uh, what's happening with the West and the relationship and the lack of... Uh, activities or a lack at least of uh, support for the free Syrian army, uh, but the struggle will continue. Uh, the people of Syria are not about to stop this revolution, and the religious uh, issues are getting, there's more tension in that, in that area, but there are also solutions in that area. And I think we need to kind of engage with those people who have the solutions and stop the bleeding to the side of extremism, and at the same time help uh, the people of Syria understand that there, there are other people on their side and support the Free Syrian Army and, and so that we can end the struggle. Because I think the longer the struggle goes on, the longer we will have uh, tensions, religious tensions in the future that could explode beyond the Syrian border, as we all know, and that could envelop the whole region. And that's, I don't think this is something that will be of benefit to anyone, of us. Uh, not to the U.S., not to uh, Syrians, not to Iraqis, Lebanese, Israelis, etc. With that, I'd like to finish this, uh, this uh, 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 presentation uh, in the hope that uh, you've learned something new, and I thank you for giving me this opportunity. If you have any questions, I'm open. Thank you, Fareed. I'm going to move through the questions, giving you a chance to answer each in turn. Apologies if any of the questions, some of which were submitted in advance, uh, repeat uh, or ask, question, uh, ask about information you may have already given, but I think the interest level is high, so if you would not mind resummarizing any